Guys, we're in the middle of a pandemic and these are trying times. It's hard on our mental health, our mental state. And this is why I love our sponsor today, BetterHelp. They're the largest online counseling platform worldwide. They change the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, affordable access to licensed therapists. BetterHelp makes professional counseling available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. It's brilliant. Sign up today. Go to betterhelp.com backslash Solving Healthcare and get 10% off sign-up fees. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Kwadra Karamante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Podcast Nation, welcome back. As usual, we got a special podcast for you. We're bringing in Dr. Heidi Dvorak. Let me tell you, she is a knowledge throwing down specialist. Just made up that term, but it's so appropriate. Listen. She is one of the co-authors of the Democratic Health Communication during COVID-19, a rapid response. And this report basically looks at communication strategies at some of the Democratic countries in, uh, throughout the world. And what I love about this is it really illustrates that, you know, shaming the public, you know, having such negative uh, viewpoints on how we should be approaching the, the pandemic really is not necessary. This is an area where we can be innovative. We can talk to the people. How do we reach out to the people and really speak in their language and to show how effective it is? It's, it's beautiful. This is what the report throws down. You may have seen her on CBC uh, commenting on some of these strategies that we think would be effective. What's worked well in our country, what, work, what, has worked, what hasn't worked well in our country. And the reason I think I really wanted to get her on the show was, you know, we have a vaccine coming. All right. And people have these viewpoints of, you know, I'm not going to take the vaccine. I'm scared. like, what is going to be the effective communication strategy that we are going to engage in it, that we are going to embrace this. And so this is why I wanted to have Heidi on the show. And, and she is, I mean, obviously an effective communicator and is a pretty special human being. Let me tell you about some of her Credentials. She's a member of the Science and Technology Studies Program, the Language Science Initiative, and the Institute of European Studies at UBC. She is, I mean, she's got degrees on degrees, PhDs on PhDs, and uh, it's a true privilege to have her on the show. So without further ado, check this, Dr. Heidi Tvorek. Quadcast Nation, I am truly excited to bring to you Dr. Heidi Tvorak, who I, I'm a new fan, but I became a monster fan after hearing you throw down on CBC talking about a communication strategy because it was so elegant. It's, you're talking about things that you think are common sense on how we can approach communication around COVID, but you know we're missing the mark in so many ways. So first of all, Heidi, thank you for joining the show. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. That's so kind. And you're quite right that a lot of communication strategies, when you talk about it, it seems like common sense. Mm. Uh, but one of the tragedies, I think, of COVID is seeing how we knew what the effective strategies were. Uh, we just haven't implemented them. And the, the tragic consequences of that are just so evident in so many countries. Wow. I, I actually, even as you say it, too, like hearing that you, you felt like we know what these strategies are. Because, I mean, I'm new to all this kind of public health stuff. As, you, as we talked about, I'm, I work in the ICU. I'm far from the preventative side. So maybe, maybe we could even just start with in terms of how we've done locally, whether Canada or you could pick a province, whatever. How do you think we have done in terms of com communication strategies in Canada? So I think one of the things in Canada is, of course, because every province has so many different approaches, we've been able to see the whole gamut, really, from um, BC doing such a good job in so many ways in the first six months of the pandemic. A lot of the Atlantic provinces also doing a pretty good job um, to some of the other provinces struggling with some of the, the basics of communication, like have just a couple of main communicators. 
don't issue confusing guidelines. Um, some of the problems is just not even reaching those kind of basic marks. So it's one of the reasons that um, in the report that I wrote, we looked at different provinces in Canada, and particularly compared BC and Ontario to show one province that was doing a pretty good job um, with one that just wasn't even hitting those basic benchmarks we'd like to see in health communications. Wow. So yeah, BC compared to Ontario, you could appreciate some of the differences. So let's spell it out. Like what's some of the main differences that you were able to appreciate um, between the two provinces? Yeah. So one of the ones that we saw was that um, in BC, we had one clear communicator was Bonnie Henry, um, quite unusually, she was doing two things at the same time. She was telling us what are the public health guidelines, and she was also giving us the sort of bigger sense of what does this mean? How should we behave? Uh, so this included, you know, the now classic, be kind, be calm, be safe. So that doesn't tell you whether to wash your hands or wear a mask or whatever. It's telling you how you should approach other people. And, and I live here in Vancouver, and I can tell you those slogans were everywhere, outside of businesses, helping people to really see this is the emotional attitude we can try and bring to this pandemic. There was no confusion because we knew this is the person you listen to. And she was very thoughtful, even in the metaphor she was using, right? So she would talk about this being a storm. Uh, one where each of us have uh, different types of boats that we're in. Some of us have, you know, the big yacht and some people have the small lifeboat, but we're all sort of getting buffeted by this storm. Um, and by contrast, in Ontario, you had lots of different communicators, right? You know, not just Doug Ford, but sort of five other people are standing on the stage, sometimes in this weird kind of military formation, <laughs> which is quite odd. Um, but what that sometimes meant as well, though, it was there was just confusion even amongst them about what you were supposed to be doing. So you can remember, you know, the sort of classic around Thanksgiving were those three minutes where five different people step up to the microphone and each one is telling you something slightly different about what you're supposed to do at Thanksgiving. So many of the people who may have been contravening guidelines wasn't because they wanted to, it's because they didn't really understand what they were. Um, and one of the other sort of differences to talk about these metaphors was that while BC was using these metaphors of a storm, um, in Ontario, there was much more use of military metaphors. So this is something that we're fighting, you know, we're fighting the virus and so on. And, and in our study, we really found that that probably isn't the best way to think about this for a whole host of reasons. One is that it's a bit authoritarian in a way, um, which is problematic in a democracy. Uh, the other is that it implies that there are some, that the people who don't obey are somehow betraying, which we worry leads to stigmatization rather than understanding. Um, and also that for most people, uh, looking back to something like World War II is not necessarily an experience that makes sense to them. Uh, we all kind of understand what a storm is, but the vast majority of people living in Canada did not live through uh, World War II. And so this metaphor doesn't really help people to know what's the attitude they should be bringing to the table. How should they be thinking about this? So even these sort of basic things of who's talking and how they're talking about it, one province, I think, did a much more effective job than another. I, and I really like these points too, Heidi, like especially when you look at BC and it's like clear messaging, like the a, like a slogan, like something that we could go back towards, like whenever we're lost or not sure how to, to respond, it's like, let's go back to our roots and, and, and say, these are, this is our foundation. This is how we're going to behave moving forward. And the other part of that that I've really appreciated it was that how it avoids shaming. Like, I think this was one of the elements of COVID that I think has been unfortunate. The fact that there's been a lot of, hey, what you're going to do can kill mom or kill grandma. Like, wear your mask. Don't leave your house. Like, obviously, nobody wants to hurt anybody and wants to do their part. But I don't, I don't know if the, the shaming and that negative premise is leading towards enhanced behavior. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do not see evidence that shaming is productive. So I think there's, there's a strange thing going on, which is that for some people, a blame game feels good in the moment. And so they, they want to point to these other horrible people who are somehow not obeying. Um, but in fact, in, in the long run, it's extremely detrimental for a whole host of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it often was blaming people for behavior that actually was perfectly fine. So you think about the summer where there was a huge amount of blaming going on about people gathering outside. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to gather anywhere, gather outside rather than inside. Um, the other point is that it implied that it was a light switch, right? Either it was 
on you were doing everything right or off you were doing everything terribly. But in a pandemic, it's more about risk mitigation. It's like a dial that we turn up or down. So how do you in your everyday life, given all your constraints, do the best that you can? And a shame game really pushes people to perhaps not be turning the dial in the right direction. And there's a couple of other things I think are super important. Um, right. Another is that it leads to stigmatization. Um, you think about young people. So it doesn't necessarily have to be about racialized groups, but any kind of group of people. So much of the summer was pointing the finger at young people and say, young people don't do this. Young people are the problem. When probably the vast majority of young people were doing the right thing. The bigger reason I think why this kind of shaming is so problematic is that it undermines our entire effort to address a public health crisis. For example, if you spend a whole summer pointing the finger at young people and saying they're not obeying, even though the evidence seems to suggest that really the vast majority of them were, that means is that any young person who might feel symptoms uh, is worried to go and get a test because if they test positive, they feel like they will be blamed and shamed. So you end up really undermining the effort to, to test, trace, and isolate because there are groups of people who are concerned about even getting a test in the first place. Now in the United States, where a couple of weeks ago, the governor of New Jersey said that 70% of people were not picking up calls from contact tracers. And so that's just a simple example of how what seems like in the moment, something that makes you feel good, you're pointing at all these people who don't seem to be obeying, actually can undermine your whole collective attempt to get this pandemic in control. It's just, it's funny when you, fr you, you just frame it like that, just intuitively, it just seemed like it was a wrong thing to do. Like it's ineffective. Like when we saw when it came to um, HIV, you know, we asking like shaming people, you clearly was ineffective. And, you know, when you frame it that way, like an example in New Jersey, seeing that people were less willing to even accept a call from public health, like that says so much. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a nice, it's nice to kind of clarify exactly why that's, that is a problem. Uh, yeah. And maybe if you, if you'll let me, can I give a, an example of where oh, actually a government did a really good job of dealing with this problem? Absolutely. Please, please. Absolutely. Yeah. So in, so in South Korea in late April, there was an outbreak that was stemming from a, a gay nightclub, the Itaewon nightclub. And, and in South Korea, there's still some lingering prejudice against LG, the LGBTQ community. And tests were not anonymous. So they were having trouble in getting people to come forward and get tested because it would mean you were actually outing yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe your family didn't know. And if you went and got tested, people would know, oh, it's because you were at this nightclub. So the South Korean government realized, well, this is an untenable situation. Um, so they made tests more anonymous. And instead of talking about this in any way related to people's identity, they just framed this as an outbreak that had happened because people were going to a club and there wasn't as much social distancing or physical distancing as we might like and made very sure not to shame or stigmatize that community. So it's an example of how even if you realize during a pandemic, oh, hang on a moment, uh, the structures that we've set up can actually end up unintentionally stigmatizing a group or shaming them. And we want to avoid that because it's also bad for the pandemic, we need to adapt as we go along. Because sometimes what happens is we don't even realize that the offhand comment in a press conference is actually creating this kind of shaming situation. Mm -hmm. uh, South Korea is a good example of how you can turn that around, even in the middle of the pandemic itself, so that you don't end up in the sort of situations that we've ended up in with young people. I, I love it. I love it. Just like readjusting your strategy so you could have the most effectiveness. And like, that's what it's all about. Like if you're asking how you're going to best serve your people, it's not about my beliefs. It's not the way I feel like it should be. It's like, how am I going to be able to reach out to the, the areas where the, there's the issues, like in this case, where the, uh, the youth um, is so good. So what about like, you know, because we talked a bit uh, before we started about how, you know, we're very U.S. centric in terms of looking for ways to approach things. And where did you find, maybe it was just South Korea, but any other places that you found had amazing communication strategies that were effective? Yes. So um, that's the beauty of, of doing a global study. So I wrote a report where with a, with a fabulous team, we looked at nine different democracies on five continents around the world. And, and one of them was Canada. But then we found just amazing examples from everywhere, ranging from Senegal, which did an incredible job of bringing in uh, religious leaders and civil society to New Zealand, which is probably a case people know more about where Jacinda Ardern did a great job with things like 
Facebook Live and so on, uh, through to South Korea and Taiwan, but even places like Norway and Denmark, um, which really just did a good job in basic communications and simple things that, again, are, are quite well known, like how do we express uncertainty? How do we deal with mistakes? And what we saw in those places was just leaders doing a good job in lots of these basics. So I think one of the things that, that I'd love to see is Canada learning more from all of these examples, not worrying so much about what the US is doing wrong, but let's look to places like Senegal, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, et cetera. Let's see what they've done right. Uh, let's learn from that and let's implement it, of course, now as COVID is ongoing. But my other hope is that we really take a big step back when the pandemic has died down and say, okay, what didn't work in our structures? Mm. What can we reform so that we never end up in this situation again where uh, so many people are affected by a disease like this? What can we do better? And we can learn from places that have done really an extraordinary job during this pandemic. Oh, I love it. And, you know, like, because I'm thinking of, you know, young people, how we reach out. Like, I think of the on our situation in Ontario. We got Ford coming in the mix with this, that, you know, that I don't know, football team or hockey team lineup saying, you know, saying what are the next steps or what the, what the Ontarians need to be doing. Um, I don't know of any young, like 22 year old is listening to that. Like, so, you know, what, what were some of amongst those countries, like, were they able to reach out to the youth? Like, and what, what did work? Yeah. So what a lot of them had was a basic understanding from the beginning that top-down stuff is important. And clearly you need government officials and public health officials up on those podiums doing their thing. But that is only one part of a comprehensive strategy. You have to pull in civil society and you have to have two-way communication so you can adjust as you go along. So I've given you the example of Senegal, where some of the most important leaders in the community are religious leaders. So they brought in imams, but also Christian leaders, even though Christians are only 5% of um, Senegalese citizens. So they made sure to bring in both from the beginning. Uh, they did things like they got a famous rap group to do a rap song in uh -huh. French and Wolof. They got a graffiti group in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, to create these beautiful murals of people wearing masks so that when you walked around the city, you were like, oh yeah, wait, I should put on my mask. Well, here's how I should be behaving. Mm. So there's just a few like very, uh, very cool, I think, neat little strategies around the edges to, to reach people. In New Zealand, they got um, various sort of famous film and radio people to um, produce ads and other sorts of things that then could be amplified by the government. Um, in Taiwan and Senegal, they had all sorts of civil society things that were happening, but they also created things like memes and stickers that you could use on their sort of equivalents of Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, and then in South Korea, one thing they did that I thought was quite smart is as early as February, because they were really sort of on top of this from January onwards. So as early as February, the Office of Communications in their CDC brought in 50 ordinary South Koreans and said, tell us what you think about our communication strategy. How can wow. we make it better? What can we do? So there's continual iterative learning. Um, and then maybe the funny thing I'll say is they were all very good at having lots of outreach on social media. So, you know, in Taiwan, they were making memes around um, the Taiwanese government's spokes dog. Um, it was called the Shiba Inu. And you had these funny little memes of the Shiba Inu is standing apart from people. And you could put that on various social media and send it around. You could get young people to do that. And I'd love to have seen more of that kind of innovation here. Lots of good graphics and things that are easy to share. So that if I'm 22 and I'm on TikTok or I'm on Snapchat, that stuff's going to reach me and I can send it to my friends. And I'm not going to do that with a clip from a press conference. This is, I, I, I mean, this is so beautiful. It's, 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 and this is what I was like saying at the beginning. It's like so logical, yet I feel like we're so far away from that. Like, and the other reason I think it's important to, to bring this up, Heidi, is, you know, I could speak uh, locally in Ontario or in, um, like our problem areas, aside from long-term care, are a lot of, um, like racialized, multi-generational, high-rise areas, um, you know, recent immigrants, like these are a lot of the problem spots. And once again, I, I'm thinking of, you got Ford coming on saying what he's got to do, what he wants to do. I don't like, I don't know if they're, these, a lot of these people are uh, understanding. I don't know if they're, uh, how relatable it is. Like, 
why why aren't we going to the root? Why are we going to the people and saying exactly like that? Um, sorry, uh, I think it was you mentioned South Korea, where the people are. You go to the people and say like, you know, is this effective? What is this uh, message being clear? Like actually going down to the roots and saying like, what? How can we better serve you and and communicate with you? So, like when you hear it out loud, it's just like, of course. Oh man. But, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, but you know, part, and part of this, part of, I think the, the problem, not just in Canada, but in a lot of countries, it's, it's very basic and it's very boring, but it's institutional capacity. You have to decide at some level that this is important and you're going to put money into it. So you have the people who can do this kind of work. And, and we see in a lot of places that that doesn't exist. Um, even though we sort of know communication is important. I think this pandemic has shown us once again, how the ability to very simply meet people where they're at, including in the languages that make sense to them or the graphics make sense to them, you need institutional capacity to do that. And we don't have enough of that in our various healthcare, whether it's hospitals could also do with more of this, right? But particularly in public health, which is traditionally so underfunded, there's definitely not enough funding for this kind of stuff because it's exactly what we need. And we see that there are and people who live in all sorts of different circumstances. And Bonnie or Henry always says, you know, we don't know their story. Um, but that's truly right. We don't know their story because we don't spend enough time trying to find their story so that we can communicate with people in ways that make sense to them. So, yes, absolutely. Good to get to their level. What is the, like, we need to speak to them. Um, speaking of which, we got a, a vaccine that might be busting out soon, uh, depending on where you are in the country. So I should stop time stamp that. So we're doing this interview on December 11th. So when it's released, who knows, a lot of you might be already have uh, had uh, some exposure. But um, I guess my question here is, you know, this may be the opportunity uh, to, to use some of these strategies that you mentioned, because there's a lot of mixed emotions about the, the vaccine. And so, like, maybe just to put you on the spot, a little bit like if you're running the campaign and like like what are the key aspects of you of us to be able to ensure the people that need to get that vaccine get that vaccine yes it is a great question so i think there's a lot of things that we we could be doing uh, right now there's things i wish we'd done a little bit early but let's talk let's say we're, we're there right now one thing i think and i hope we can get right this time is what i'm going to call the science meta narrative so we need to explain to people, how does this stuff really work? So this is, I think, where we went a little bit wrong at the beginning of the pandemic. We didn't spend enough time telling people, listen, it's a novel coronavirus. That means it's new. We are going to find out a lot about it. Scientists are doing their best. We're going to find out a lot about it. And that means that guidelines will change because we will learn more about this disease. So if guidelines change, that actually means that scientists are doing their job. So please expect things to change. And that may have solved, I think, a lot of our problems around masks. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine we now, we learn from that mistake, we apply to vaccines. And we say, listen, this is how vaccine development usually works. This is why it usually takes 10 years. Here's what we've done to make it much faster. Is not that we skipped stages, we just ran them simultaneously. And to be as transparent and clear as possible in that kind of science meta-narrative. So keep explaining to people, all right, there are a few people with adverse reactions. Why is that not a concern? Um, what do we know and what are we doing to keep you safe? So that kind of meta-narrative stuff is, I think, really crucial so people understand this is actually how a vaccine gets developed. This is why it's trustworthy, number one. Number two, being as transparent as possible with any of those cases reacting fast. We saw that in the UK. There were already a couple of people who had adverse reactions, but the fact they came out very quickly, explained why, gave guidelines to people who might be affected, helps to maintain trust so we understand what's going on. Mm. Third element is let's apply all those strategies I was talking about, right? To meet people where they're at. So let's get going with, let's, let's have those many languages. We've already seen, I think, some learning here. If you go on the CBC or on the BBC, you see much better graphics <laughs> about these vaccines, but let's keep going with that. Let's, let's ensure that we meet people where they're at, whether it's young people or others. And then the fourth would be, let's pull in civil society to help us. Um, there are different groups of people who can, who can reach the people in their community much better than I can. I can speak to certain communities, but there are others where I am humble enough to know I don't know the best way to reach them. Actually, I need to learn about how to do that. I need to bring in that civil society. And maybe if I'll add one final one, it is that you need to ensure that people get into conversations. 
because what we see from you know many years of trying to work with people who are anti-vaxxer is if you get them into a room and you really listen to them, you hear their concerns and you have a conversation, um, you can get about half of them to vaccinate their children. Um, it's a lot of effort though. You have to spend that time. You can't dismiss their concerns. You have to use the many strategies we know about risk communication and persuasion, um, but we're going to need to do that too, right? We can't just have a social media campaign and be done with it. We're gonna need some doctors and nurses and others to have the time and space to sit in rooms and, and talk with people. So we need to already be planning for when we get to that last kind of 20, 30% where there'll be people who are very nervous about the vaccine to invest those kind of resources. So we need to plan for that now. Yeah. And there's so many elements of beauty in there, but one I think is um, that I think I hope we learned in the beginning is that authentic piece of being upfront that we're learning and if we felt that you've made an error or a misjudgment to be upfront with people, I could, I could say personally, when I see a leader say, you know what, like, you know, we misread that, we did, misinterpreted that, this is what we've learned and this is the direction to go. I have way more, give them way more street cred compared to when they're like, uh, yeah, there was just, you know, there was a, someone else's mistake. This is not what we said. This is where we're moving forward. You know, like, so I think that's a great point. Um, Investing resources to have doctors and nurses have conversations with people oh, who yeah. are worried about vaccines. Absolutely. And then the other piece is just like communication one-on-one. Like, <laughs> be, like, listen, stop talking so much. Listen to those that are concerned. And often, it's, as you put, you know, if you sit down with anti-vaxxers, their kids could still be vaccinated based on the fact that you have an authentic um you know, uh, empathetic conversation where you're vo- listening to the concerns and maybe there's some misinterpretation that you could, uh, that you could clarify on or the fact that someone on the other side is willing to listen that alone, you know, especially in my world, uh, taking care of patients like this, this is everything. So man, I, and the other thing I wanted to say in terms of this is to think ahead. I, I, I don't know. We've been so re- reactive in this pandemic. It's been like almost insane. Like some of this is so predictable, like, you know, us getting busier in the fall and the winter months and, um, you know, but like knowing that there's going to be some backlash in terms of acceptance of the the vaccine, let's anticipate that. Let's make the steps, as you mentioned, to enhance that communication, update our graphics, reach out to the people and say, hey, this is coming. What can we do to improve understanding and, and engagement? Heidi dropping knowledge like crazy um any parting words Heidi that you, you, that uh, come to mind in terms of communication in general where we're, where we're moving towards in the future any the, the the floor is yours so I think we should end on an optimistic note which is that when we look at places like Taiwan and South Korea that have really been for so many people these shining examples of a great response when we look at why they're so good it's because they learn from mistakes they made in the past So in Taiwan, they had a terrible time with SARS in 2002-03. And in South Korea, they had real problems with the MERS outbreak in 2015. And after those problems, instead of just saying, oh, we'll just keep going, those governments sat down and said, we need to reform our public health. We need to have legal and institutional reforms so that we are ready for the next pandemic. Because the, the sad truth is, some sort of pandemic or epidemic can always come. And so what's so impressive and I think hopeful for us is if we really sit down and think, how can we reform our structures? How do we make our communications better alongside all sorts of other things? Next time we can be Taiwan or South Korea. It's not at all impossible. And I hope that we will get there. And I think the kind of openness to learning from other places is certainly how we can ensure that we never end up in the situation that we're in this fall ever again. I think that that is a perfect place to end up. Heidi, I, I, I mean, I'm in awe of you and your team and the, the, what you've been able to put together because it's such an important message that I think can have a monster impact on the way we move forward to, uh, in regards to this pandemic and anything, anything else moving forward because there's a ton of lessons there that I think everyone needs to, to listen to. So I just want to commend you and it's been a true privilege to have you on the show. Oh, the privilege is all mine. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Appreciate it. Quadcast Nation, tell me that wasn't gangster. Heidi throwing down knowledge like that. Come on, y'all. 
Don't you feel inspired? Don't you feel like we, we, could, uh, we could do better? Don't you feel like tomorrow's going to be a better day? For real. You guys, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Quadcast. Leave any comments at Quadcast99 at gmail.com. Leave us, please, a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast, and it helps with the visibility of the show while we try and change that boogie, yo. Check out our Solving Healthcare shop where you can get the merchandise. You can get a virtual summits, including low-carb and stress management. Changing that boogie, as we know, as we know. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. We're going to connect again real soon. Peace.